I'm sure if I ask a majority of the video game community if they like Kingdom Hearts, I'd get a decent amount of hands being raised. Same if I asked them about card games. However, what would happen if we were to combine the two to make 2004's Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories? Kingdom Hearts with some card dueling action style gameplay? Well, why don't I give you a brief look into what I think of this combination? Now despite that being a little hyperbolic, I won't deny the fact that this game just wasn't for me. In fact, I remember a few people reaching out to me and saying, Oh god, you're looking at every game in the series? Good luck with this one. And this one. What have I done? Same as the first video, I'm gonna point out that I won't be playing the original release of the game. Chain of Memories was originally on the Game Boy Advance, and was a direct sequel to Kingdom Hearts. Now, being a young boy when this exclusive title came out, not everybody was privileged enough to own this handheld console. Which made it a little confusing when you booted up Kingdom Hearts 2 and thought to yourself, what the fuck, did, did I miss something? Such is the fate of those who play the series in numerical order and logically think the spin-off stories aren't woven in of a central narrative. In 2007, the game was remade in Japan for the PlayStation 2, later to be released in North America in 2008, and Europe finally being able to play this version years later in 2013, when it was released in the PS3 HD bundle. I'll be covering this remake, otherwise known as Re-Chain of Memories. The remake completely redid the graphics, going from pixel art to 3D models, environments, and camera angles from the first game, adding animated cutscenes with a few tweaks here and there to the game gameplay where they thought was necessary. So, going from a game where I thought the story was incredibly dumb but charming, and gameplay which was archaic but still held my attention and was for the most part fun, to a title where the gameplay made me want to put salt in an open wound, and a story which, in an opinion which may come across as controversial, gave me more of an emotional impact than the entirety of Kingdom Hearts 1, I can't wait to start explaining myself. So, let's officially start this video off where we left our three heroes, Sora, Donald and Goofy, at the ending of Kingdom Hearts 1. One. The three main characters, lost in an unnamed location after saving the world from Ansem, find themselves mysteriously attracted to the world's worst castle design by a man dressed in a black hoodie. All three walk up to the castle doors, only for Sora's brain to boot up late and recognise exactly what is in front of them. In actuality, there seems to be a bit of outside tampering going on, as all of the gang have a strong feeling that Riku and the King are here, inside the castle, after they went missing due to closing the door to darkness. Seriously? Me too. One look at this castle, and I just knew. Along with any other worlds out there, I want to see them all. So, at some point from the ending of Kingdom Hearts and the beginning of Chain of Memories, Sora's voice broke. I wish I was there to hear Donald and Goofy try their best to explain what's going on with his body as Sora not only fights the darkness inside every heart, but his intense growing pains and sudden lust for the sweeter things in life. Our very best friends. They're here. Uh, uh. Yep, I had it too. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention Jiminy Cricket. He's been with us for the entire time, documenting our adventures in his journal, which serves as a bestiary for characters and enemies we encounter. I felt like bringing him up in the original video was kinda pointless, but in this game his role is a little more important. So there we go, I introduced the fucking insect. Moving on. Sora's all ready to get the ball rolling, but after calling Donald a pussy, oh the man in black appears behind them. Donald's quick temper actually introduces the fact that every single technique they learned in the previous game has been wiped the second they entered the mysterious castle, called Castle Oblivion. The hooded edge boy phases through Sora, then teleports behind him, apparently sampling his memories and creating a card of Traverse Town. We enter through the first door, bringing us into, where else, Traverse Town. The man in black gives us a basic rundown of the gameplay, and we're introduced to some old friends we met in the first game, Leon, Yuffie and Aerith. But here's the kicker. None of it fucking matters! Chain of Memories essentially does what the first game did when it comes to incorporating Disney into its storyline. Instead of travelling to different worlds using the gummy ship, you go through doors in Castle Oblivion using cards forged from your memories. Keyword there is memory. None of the people you meet in these worlds are real. They're fictional characters in a fictional game, being conjured up by Sora's memories. It got on my tits how despite the trio acknowledged these worlds being nothing more than a physical manifestation of memories, they still treat the characters as if they're real people? Maybe I'm the real Heartless here. I mean, that would explain why I feel nothing inside. Save me, Goofy. So what I'm gonna do in this video to save us a whole bunch of time is focus on the stuff that really matters in the grand scale of the Kingdom Hearts universe. 
This tends to be events that happen within Castle Oblivion after you complete a world. But before I dive headfirst into a pool of black hoodies and darkness, I really need to talk about the gameplay. I think it's safe to say that I have a few things to say about this. Chain of Memories has a combination of hack and slash and card dueling gameplay. You have a deck of cards on the bottom left hand side of the screen, and your job is to chain these cards together to inflict damage, use offensive magic or cures, and when your enemy uses a card, it's your job to find a card with a high a number to counter this attack. An important thing to add is an enemy or the player can counter any technique used regardless of its number if they play a card with the number zero. You can chain cards together using the triangle button which keeps them stored at the top of your screen. And if you get the numbers right you can unleash a slate. Slates are made up of a majority of moves you had in Kingdom Hearts 1, but this time you need to use basic mathematics to roughly hit the number of that technique. When you get into an encounter which functions like some traditional JRPGs where you run into an enemy on the map then go into a fight, you'll sometimes see green cards bouncing around. If you collect them, you can summon your friends to assist you. Some of them serve in quite useful and others not so much. Thank you Pluto, you're my greatest ally! So going from that brief explanation, it doesn't sound that bad. The very mention of the word mathematics would send shivers down my spine, but considering how I could still pull it off whilst having a legitimate mental block when it comes to math, if I can do it, you can too. However, my biggest issue doesn't lie exclusively with the gameplay. It just has a role to play in a much bigger issue. I'll cover that much later into the video though. Gotta keep a few eggs in the basket. Navigating levels is fairly simple. Whenever you interact with a door in a room, you need to use a card which relates to the number or colour being shown on the screen. However, each card has an effect. So, using the card Teeming Darkness means there will be more enemies in the next room. Using this card means you'll find a saving spot and using a Moogle will allow you to purchase and sell cards. This need to use cards to open doors gets particularly obnoxious in the later levels, as you'll sometimes just run out of a number you need to open a door meaning you'll have to backtrack and do a spot of good old fashioned grinding. Now you know me, I'm a JRPG boy at heart and I'd be lying if I said grinding isn't a therapeutic pastime for me. However, at the point I was at where grinding was necessary to progress, my patience was already running thin. So I think it's about time I stop teasing you all and dig a little deeper into the story, so we can finally reach the point which I'm gonna call fucking shit. The further the trio get into Castle Oblivion, the more foggy their memory becomes. What's equally strange is Jiminy's journal which documented their travels in Kingdom Hearts 1 has been wiped clean. The man in the black hoodie told us as we were entering, to find is to lose and to lose is to find. If we break this down into baby boy terms, it means the further they progress into Castle Oblivion, the more memories they'll lose. It's also revealed to us that there's more than one individual who wears black hoodies. In fact, there's an abundance of them. Introducing Tetsuya no Mora's Brigade of Clowns, who are, within this game at least, seen as nothing more than mysterious humans who have a purpose for Sora. But oh no my friends, these guys were a little more important to the story than they let on. I'm just gonna cut the bullshit and explain exactly what they are, instead of waiting till the next Kingdom Hearts video. You may call it impatience, I call it getting to the point. Remember in the first video when I talked about what happens if a person loses their heart to the darkness? The heart turns into a heartless and in most cases the body disappears, but people who coincidentally are aren't Disney characters, have a strong will, and are extremely attractive, can involuntarily leave their bodies behind, which turn into bodies without heart or emotion, dubbing themselves Nobodies. The best of the best forming a group named Organization 13. The Nobodies that inhabit Castle Oblivion are working under a leader named Marluxia, and their reasons for leading Sora into this castle remain a mystery for now. A Nobody named Axel clashes with Sora to test his strength, and plants a seed of doubt in his head after mentioning that he may have forgotten a third person Sora was searching for, besides Riku and the King. Axel meets with one of his comrades, who discuss his apparent interest in Sora. This nobody named Larkseen is a surprising favourite of mine. She clearly has fun fucking with Sora as he progresses further up, but the voice actress Chanel Workman Grey gives such a good performance that I can't help but enjoy myself whenever she's on screen. I created another card from your memories, you know. Be a good boy and say thanks. So, Sora keeps going higher and higher, his memory becoming foggier and foggier, but one memory he won't lose is his memory of Kairi, due to holding her good luck charm she gave him in Kingdom Hearts 1. However, as Sora remembers his promise, another girl with blonde hair appears in his memory. Puzzled by this, he continues on. We then cut to that blonde haired girl, who appears to be drawing herself into Sora's memories. Sora recollects there being a third friend on the island, a girl who sat and drew 
as the two boys play fought, but then suddenly left, assumedly moving away. After we find out that Larkseen and Axel, being led by Marluxia, are planning on overtaking the organization using Sora as a tool, Larkseen decides to drop in and be a smug cunt for five minutes and teases Sora about the girl he can't seem to remember, even pointing out that he owns a pendant she gave to him when she left the island. After this, Luxine manages to push a name out of Sora's memory, the name of the blonde girl we saw before. Her name is revealed to be Namine. You really are a hero. A heartless hero. <coughs> you are just a baby. <coughs> Sora, what the fuck are you doing? Calm down, you fucking psychopath. Donald and Goofy are stood over there like, oh god, Sora, are you okay? After the battle with Larkseem, we're introduced to another hooded Melvin named Vexen, a man who boasts his rank in the organization with great pride and looks down on Axel and Larkseem. Already knowing about Sora, he's all, I want to experiment intimately on this little boy, hmm, but instead sends one of his experiments to do the job for him. I'm a scientist. Experiments are what I do. Yes. What's with that line delivery? Shouldn't it be, I'm a scientist, experiments are what I do, yes? Instead we get, experiments are what I do. Yes. Now I'm sure it's no fault of yours, rather the person in charge of directing your lines. Going back to Sora, he's charging ahead of Donald and Goofy on a new crusade to rescue Namine, who is apparently located within the castle. However, on the next floor, he bumps into Riku instead. Riku's like, I thought you were my friend, but you're nothing but stinky. Riku, no, you stupid. No, Sora, you forgot about me and Namine. No, you're the stupid. So they fight, and he runs off with piss running down his leg. If it wasn't obvious from that bit I brought up earlier, this isn't the real Riku. It's a Riku rep replica created by Vexen, sent after Sora to test whether or not he's worthy. Sora and the gang, not realising that this Riku is a fake by this point, assume he's just lost his memories during his ascension into Castle Oblivion and give chase. He states that protecting Namine is all that matters at this point, and when Sora tries to snap him out of it, it results in, you guessed it, I bet Riku will come around if you just talk to him. Well, it didn't work very well the first few times, did it? What's interesting to note is on the next floor, it appears that all memory of Kairi has vanished from Sora's mind, only to be replaced with Namine. We then see Axel talk to Namine, her first proper appearance to us so far. He calmly mocks her, only to end the sentence with, we nobodies can never hope to be somebodies, a line I'll bring up again in another video, so keep this tucked neatly in your memory. Memory. Shortly after, we're given a first look at the face of our antagonist, Marluxia. <laughs> Do you just keep pedals in your hood for the epic reveals? Do I need to call someone a Melvin again? Essentially, Marluxia claims that Vexen's Riku replica was a failure, so he taunts Vexen into eliminating Sora, as attacking Sora will prove his disloyalty, allowing him to be taken out as a traitor. Vexen, however, not only plans to take out Sora, but wants to do it in a way which will ruin Marluxia's plot in the process. You must eliminate the traitor, Lord Axel. I will fucking do it, my master. Vexen, digging into Sora's memories, creates a world called Twilight Town, a location that Sora has never been to, but feels like he has. Vexen appears, telling Sora that this world was made from a memory located on the other side of his mind. Well, don't worry, this is all explained in a later title. After fighting with Vexen again, Axel appears to take care of the traitor. No! Please don't! I don't want to- Goodbye. Oh, come on, Sora. Are you gonna look shocked now when you've killed dozens before and even beat an actual real-life cheater to death? Or did you forget that from climbing the fucking castle? Back to Axel, who's speaking with Namine, he actually manages to persuade her to escape since Marluxia isn't around to guard her. To the audience, this seems like nothing more than something to amuse Axel. But then when we see him elicit shock from feeling amusement, we remember that nobodies feel no emotions, which is surprising because nearly every nobody we've encountered seem pretty emotional. Like, I get that later we find out that they're pretending to feel emotion because feeling anything is what they crave, but why am I meant to be intimidated by this guy when his aggressiveness is falsified? Was he pretending to be scared when he fucking died? Or was it a HAL 9000 response to being terminated? I guess we'll never find out. Or will we? The next memory Sora has to explore is Destiny Islands, where he ends up coming face to face with Namine. While Sora is celebrating seeing his old friend, she tells him with 
two copies of herself for some reason, but his memories of her aren't real. Sora, being predictably Sora, doesn't believe her at all, but Namine corrects his memory a bit by revealing that her good luck charm isn't hers at all, allowing the image of Kairi to re-enter Sora's memory. Now, here's a shocker. I love this game's story whenever Namine is involved. Her powers are interesting, her voice actress does a wonderful job in the cutscene, and she's the main driving force of Sora's motivation. He tells her what we already know, that his memories are false, and Namine admits to this. Sora, frustrated that he can't remember Kairi's name, doesn't get the answer as to why this is the case. As Namine's knight in whining armor gate crashes the scene, being all, Fear not, milady, I'll protect you from this scandalous fiend. He gives Sora an open-handed slap, but is saved by Namine, who literally breaks his heart. That's a much better position for you, baby boy. Just have a little nap. Larxene steps in and tells Sora everything, that all of his memories were implanted into him by Namine against her own will, who can, for some reason, meddle with Sora's memory, and also affect people who are travelling near him. The memories implanted into the Riku replica were due to Vexen's experimentations. She also brings up that their entire motive within Castle Oblivion was to make the Keyblade master their puppet with the use of Namine, and it probably would have succeeded if it wasn't for Axel's meddling. But despite knowing that all of his memories are false, a promise he made to Namine to keep her safe feels real enough to him, so he fights Larxene and eliminates her. The next conversation we have with Namine is one of my favourites, and kind of makes me like Sora as a character kind of. Namine admits the only reason she did what she did is not only because she was forced to, but because she was lonely. Being kept captive in Castle Oblivion with no access to the outside world, she altered Sora's memory not only to begrudgingly help Marluxia in the traitor's plans, but to have a friend. Sora admits that he should be angry at her, but he can't bring himself to. And that even though the memories of her smile were fake, he tells Namine that her laughter and smile here aren't false at all. <laughs> there! That's it. That's the nominee I remember. Even though, you know, you don't know her at all? <laughs> Sora, fuck me. Up next is another twist, if you can call it that. Marluxia's like, you're a traitor, Axel. And Axel's all, no, I am no traitor. It is you who is the traitor, Marluxia, by brainwashing Sora into taking down the organization with you and Larkscene. Haha, I mean, I kind of assumed you knew that from the beginning, but no matter, now we must fight. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, gotta go. What are you gonna do now, you Melvin? Oh, Sora, Axel's gonna be mean to Namine. What are you gonna do? Oh, you're such a cunt, Malusha. <laughs> Axel is defeated by Sora, meaning there's only one more obstacle in their way. Oh, also, Riku replica turned up again. I don't care. <laughs> I don't fucking care. Marluxia, very similar to Ansem in Kingdom Hearts 1, is a multiple part boss fight. You first fight him one on one, then he transforms into one of the most visibly interesting boss designs I think I've ever seen in a Kingdom Hearts game. Like, no joke, I actually think this design is one of Nomura's tightest pieces of work and I commend him for it. His final form is about as ridiculous as you can imagine, with one of his techniques making you drop your deck of cards like a clumsy arsehole and you have to scurry to pick them all up before he smacks you dead. As you can guess though, we defeat him, leaving me wondering if every organization member can transform like this, or if Marluxia was graciously gifted it by the final boss gods. With Marluxia defeated, Namine offers Sora a choice. She can restore his memories, but he'll forget everything that occurred in Castle Oblivion, including ever meeting Namine. Or he can stay as he is, and remain with Namine in Castle Oblivion. Sora chooses the former, and there's this nice little moment where Namine flinches at the response, knowing she'll be left alone again. She agrees with our argument though, and places Sora, Donald and Goofy into three pods. That'll put them into a deep sleep while Namine works on restoring their memories. Sora, still not wanting to forget Namine, is told by Jiminy Cricket that he can write down the words, thank Namine, in his journal. So, when they eventually wake up, it might elicit some kind of response. As the pod doors close on Sora, he tries desperately to remember the name of the girl he forgot. And before he falls into a deep sleep, he remembers the name Kairi. Did you think it was over? Oh, honey child, how very wrong you are. Yep, that's right, Riku has a story in Chain of Memories, which covers, you guessed it, Riku and King Mickey shenanigans after they close the door to darkness. Considering how long this video has been going on for, I'm gonna try my best to condense as much of Riku's storyline as I can, only leaving in the most important details, and finally explain why I won't touch this game again for many years. But first, I wouldn't go any further without explaining the gameplay differences. The gameplay is a little different from Sora's, 
characters. Instead of choosing your own cards, the game chooses them for you. You level up three stats, the first being hit points, the second is attack, and the third is DP, which translates to darkness points. With this, Riku can transform into his dark side mode after you chain a certain amount of cards together. You can then chain cards and activate your slate, similar to how Sora does it. There's also another element to his gameplay known as dueling, where you clash your weapons and have to quickly skim through your deck in order to counter whatever number is being shown on the bottom of the screen. Back to Riku, his story is about him controlling the darkness in his heart, instead of allowing it to take control. He's guided to Castle Oblivion by a mysterious voice, and unlike Sora, when Riku climbs Castle Oblivion, his memories won't be affected. However, things inevitably still get in his way, those being Vexen and his underlings Lexeus and Zexia the Riku replica, and finally, Ansem. Yeah, when we defeated Ansem beforehand, we didn't destroy all of him. A part of him still clings onto Riku's darkness like a parasite, and tries to manipulate him to use it so he can climb back into a young boy. King Mickey also assists Riku on his ascent, serving as a ray of light in his edgy, tortured adventure. What tickles me the most about Riku's story is this really weird inclusion that isn't brought up again, at least to my knowledge. It's the idea that darkness has a smell? During multiple parts of Riku's story, he's like, Poo wee, I know that's you, Ansem, I can smell your stinky darkness from over here. It's different from other darkness, I can tell from the stench. Like, what the fuck? Is this a darkness exclusive thing, or does light have an equally pungent odour? I don't get it! So, to cut a long story short, Riku defeats Luxeus and Zexion as he climbs through the castle. Though Zexion's final demise will be at the hands of the Riku replica, who absorbs his powers thanks to Axel's manipulation, thinking this will make him unique and not a total clone. But despite this boost in strength, Riku still manages to take him out. The replica wonders where a fake's heart like his will go, Riku telling him he's sure it will go where his will. I think it's kind of interesting to note that this is technically one of the only original characters in the Kingdom Hearts story to die and stay dead so far. Who knows, maybe he'll make his epic comeback in Kingdom Hearts 3, not if anyone gives a shit. Before we have our final confrontation with Ansem yet again, we bump into Christopher Lee, otherwise known as Diz, this man being the voice that guided Riku to Castle Oblivion. Diz, or so I am known. You, I've watched you all along. He also seems to want Ansem dead just as much as Mickey and Riku. We also bump into Namine, who's already working on restoring Sora's memories. She tells us that Ansem resides in Riku's heart, and is summoned out of it by Diz for Riku to defeat. Riku takes on the darkness that threatens to consume him, and uses it as a force of good, and we finally see the demise of heartless Ansem. Both King Mickey and Riku decide to join Diz when the battle is over, in order to protect Namine while she works on restoring Sora's memory. They don the hoodies that the organization wear, as it apparently renders them almost invisible to the organization. Riku takes his first steps into Dawn, now utilizing both the powers of light and darkness. So, what was it that made me dislike this game? Let's finally get into it. You can break this title. It's also far too long, especially when you need to repeat levels when you play as Riku, and some of the bosses are offensively aggravating. Sora's story was actually okay for me, for around 10 hours or so, but when 10 hours doubled to 20, I was getting sick of using the same combination of cards to activate one slate which is proven to break most bosses. One, two, three, triangle, Sonic Blade. One, two, three, triangle, Sonic Blade. When I eventually found out that Sonic Blade is used as a way to cheese most bosses, I wasn't taking it completely serious, until I tried it. You can get bosses caught up in a single attack for multiple strikes, and so long as you keep a few elixirs in your deck to refresh your cards, you'll defeat a majority of them extremely easily. Then you move on to Riku, and whilst there are gameplay differences to Sora and it's less easy to cheese, going into dark side mode makes anything less of a challenge and more of a small obstacle getting in the way of another cutscene. And the fight against Ansem, oh my god. I won't bullshit you, this is the first time in years I've made a verbal noise of frustration when I'm beaten by a boss. The most annoying thing for me was when you need to heal, and King Mickey, your only way of healing, sits there fingering his arsehole for a full 30 seconds, giving Ansem ample opportunity to throw a cheeky zero in there and cancel the heal completely. Needing to scroll through your deck whilst avoiding Ansem's moves and throwing your own zeros in there from time to time wasn't fun for me. I 
hated it, and I was glad it was over, and well, that's depressing. If they combined Sora and Riku's story together, similar to how Dream Drop Distance did, then it'd feel less like a slog to power through. But they didn't, and this is what we're left with. If I had to recommend Re-Chain of Memories to you, I'd suggest playing it for 10 hours and seeing how you feel. If you're sick of it by 10 hours, there's no way you'll be having fun for the other approximate 20 hours you'll be doing next. Despite not enjoying this game, there are still things within the title that held some value to me. I mean, I won't take back what I said, the entire Namine storyline hit an emotional note for me. I really, really liked it. But sadly, cutscenes didn't excuse the main meat of this title. For me, at least. I've heard that the Game Boy Advance version of this game is actually much better. And whilst I can't say for certain if this is true, maybe go check out that before you play this. Oh, and one more thing. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. As you just saw, I'll be taking a short break from the Kingdom Hearts series to focus on a group of videos I know a lot of you have wanted me to do. This next project is going to be an absolute beast to complete, so now is as good a time as any to chip into my Patreon and help old Clemsy out. I appreciate every single dollar I receive, and I want to share a massive thank you to all of the lovely names you see scrolling on the right. Hugs and kisses, I'll see you all later.